Hello everyone, this is Sean Ferringer and welcome to the Boundary Systems Import Data Doctor presentation we're going to do today. Um, we're going to have a few short slides today that we'll go through and um, then we'll dive right into a presentation and some actual um, workflow and demonstration as it relates to um, a, a host of topics um, for Import Data Doctor. Um, so with that being said, we're going to dive right in and kind of optimize everybody's time today and go ahead and get started. We've got a host of attendees. Um, just to let everybody know, um, when it comes time for asking questions and such, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And um, by all means, you're definitely encouraged to ask questions at that time. Um, we do, however, encourage that um, you use the GoToWebinar functionality to post a question to me, the presenter, um, as opposed to um, us handling that through audio. Um, it typically creates a lot of conflict if we attempt to turn all of the attendees on for audio. So um, please utilize the GoToWebinar functionality um, to go ahead and post a question to me um, at the end of this session if you do, in fact, have any. Um, at the end of the session, we'll obviously also have my contact information and the contact information for our team at Boundary Systems on the screen and available to you as well um, to screenshot and follow up on as necessary. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and dive right in today. Um, a little bit uh, about our agenda um, for this webinar today. Um, we're going to have a little introduction to Boundary Systems and myself. Um, as I said, a short few slides here. Um, um, we're going to have a little overview. I'll just explain a little bit about what we're going to talk about. And um, then we'll dive right into the demonstration of some import data doctor material, as I mentioned. And at the end, as, as I just mentioned a second ago, we'll have our Q&A session um, related to all of this material. So with that being said, a little bit about me. Um, I am a Boundary Systems Technical Specialist. I've been a PTC CAD user since about 2001. I've been a certified uh, PTC instructor with these folks since 2006. Um, my primary experience focus um, relates to CAD modeling, data exchange, uh, PTC mold design operations, uh, PTC manufacturing stuff as well as large assemblies are some of the things I focus a great deal on. There are a host of other duties that all of us on the technical team support, but those would be my specialties if we would say such a thing. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, a great deal more about Boundary Systems, arguably, is um, the host of companies that um, the team supports and services both with respect to sales, implementation, and training. Um, we have a host of capabilities related to the software side involving data management, um, CAD design, simulation, uh, product development, you name it. Um, we're there to help. Uh, Boundary Systems has been awarded uh, numerous times um, for their work. Um, some of those awards and some of that accreditation is listed on your screen now. Some additional information about the software solutions that Boundary Systems provides is available on this slide. Um, here we see the obviously PTC um, material that we'll be talking about today, as well as systems like Moldex 3D, um, Sigmaxim, Keyshot, etc., uh, ZWCAD, a host of, of great products that uh, Boundary Systems sells and supports. Um, today's topic that we're going to speak to is going to be import data doctor you are looking on this slide at the import data doctor ribbon environment um, that we'll be working around in and looking at today as we have our import data doctor uh, webinar demonstration um, this is just a, a ribbon overview of what import data doctor looks like when we're there um, the purpose of the import data doctor functionality is to handle the CAD translation problems that arise um, during the, the trade of 3D data in typical CAD systems in, in modern days. Um, we have a host of products out there that are very common. Um, PTC, obviously, um, some other big name products that are used in things like aerospace a little bit might be some CATIA. Um, you find some unigraphics in um, automotive circles, things to that effect. Um, so there's a host of other products that are creating CAD data. 
um, that we do have to share with, whether we get that data as inputs from a vendor or we're getting that data as inputs from a client. Um, irrespective, we're trying to utilize that data inside of Creo Parametric. And um, sometimes when we bring that data in, it doesn't come into the standard that we want in the modeling system, meaning we don't have a solid model or there you know, are inherent problems in it. Maybe it just bloody won't import at all. Um, there can be a host of issues that relate to importing a model between two systems. Um, one of the things I try to make the time to do in my webinars um, is at this time, take a little bit of time before we dive into Import Data Doctor to explain some very important concepts to you about importing data um, as a general theory and overview, if you will. Um, some things you need to know. Uh, PTC has a very, very unique universe for model accuracy and spatial definition. Um, PTC is capable uniquely of operating in two modes of accuracy. Um, that relates to relative accuracy and absolute accuracy. It's incredibly important for the CAD modeling engineer that is importing objects to understand that this exists and to understand the concepts of what their own templates, as we'll talk about in the, in the demonstration, um, what their own templates provide and that they import the model properly to uh, you know, handle these implications of accuracy based on not only the expected model size, um, spatially, you know, how big is this object in physical size, uh, but also the consideration of its data quality expectations. Um, what are the data quality expectations of this object? A key theory of relative accuracy is the concept that larger data objects subsequently require less accuracy. That is awesome as it relates to the concepts of file storage, um, in terms of the disk space footprint that the PTC product has, as well as the concept of regeneration cycles and managing spatially very large objects inside the CAD system. However, it runs countercurrent to the, the, you know, the nature of importing files because we must in fact deal with and consider this implication of relative or absolute accuracy when we do import a file. I will explain in greater detail when we actually get into the demonstration why I gave you all of that, but it is an important concept to understand that PTC is a little bit unique on both the delivery side, meaning what we give people out of PTC as an export, and most definitely as what we retain or what we receive from others as an import to the product. So we need to keep this in mind as we proceed through the demonstration, and that'll be a big part of my focus as I explain to how to import data in the correct way in modern times. Because there are two key things I want everybody to take away from this webinar at the end of the day. And if you're still participating and remember nothing else about anything I say, remember the following two things. In 2020, friends don't send friends I just files. And you can't get back math that never existed. Those are two concepts that relate to data exchange that should never be forgotten. You get the math that was created, irrespective of the math you might want, and we just don't send IGES files anymore. Everybody does a much better job of managing and handling and exchanging the step file standard. I strongly, professionally, adamantly encourage it to be used under all possible circumstances. The only justification in my professional opinion now for IGES files relates to the existence of a legacy IGES file object um, that subsequently is not available to be a step file in any other way. I recognize those things do exist and sometimes we have to deal with those things. But absent that, we should work very hard to work to provide step files to the people we share with and we should work to, to see that they give us a step file from their system. Um, step files are producible by everything now that is, that is talkable in today's CAD world, um, whether that be SolidWorks or CATIA or whatever the package is. Um, if it's worth talking about, it will generate a step file for you to use. So with that being said, um, that's a little bit of the high-level overview theory. Import Data Doctor is intended to fix the problems that occur 
when we import objects that were pro created problematically, or in some case, let's say that, you know, they're just, we've got a conflict between systems. And that I do recognize that that does in fact occur, that, you know, some systems, because of, they might be dated, um, especially if you have a very old legacy piece of software, um, creating a, a, a 3D output file, and you're trying to import that into a more modern system. I do recognize there, there can be difficulties there. And that is exactly um, what import data doctors intended to speak to and does an extremely powerful job, um, especially when coupled with all of the power of Creo, as you'll see today, um, to kind of go ahead and speak to those importing problems and get us to a place where we have a model that we really want to work with. Okay, so with that being said, that's our import data doctor overview, if you will. Um, we're going to proceed right into the webinar demo, or excuse me, the webinar demo. Um, this object um, that you see on the screen right now is what we're going to go fix today. And we're going to talk about a lot of the different concepts in Import Data Doctor um, as we go through that process. And we're going to start by talking about the concepts of accuracy and how that relates to importing, as I just mentioned. So with that, we're going to dive right in. So I'm going to go ahead and put this away, and I'm going to bring up Creo here um, for us to kind of take a look at and start working on the Creo side of this. So with that being said, we're going to get Creo up on the screen here, So, and we're going to go import this object now. So one of the things that I mentioned, as I did earlier and adamantly, is the concept of accuracy as it relates to importing objects. So here today we have this... Uh, basic problems with sliver step file object that we're going to go import. And it is the object that's available in uh, PTC's little tutorial about all things import data doctor. Um, unfortunately, at the risk of full disclosure, I went to look that up today on PTC's website uh, to share the link with everybody and was unable to find it, unfortunately. It probably still exists and I just couldn't locate it today. Uh, but that being said, my contact information will be up at the end of this webinar. Um, if you reach out to me by email, I promise to find a way to share the PDF and what that content would be with you um, one way or another, even if I can't find it locally on PTC's website today. So keep that in mind if you want some of the follow-up information that I'll be showing you and uh, speaking to and some of those things in this case. But one of the one of the big implications that I just mentioned, um, there were two rules. We weren't going to do IGES files anymore and that we couldn't get back math that we never had. So one of the important concepts about importing an object is to recognize what its math is. Not the math that you want, not the company standard math, not your company standard accuracy, whatever that might be. That is irrelevant. This object was created in another system, and it has a definition of accuracy from that system. Um, we can want it to be something else in our system, but importing it doesn't make it that thing. So what we need to do is figure out what the real accuracy of this object is. And that's the first part of our import process now. So I'm going to go ahead and tell it to import this step file. And the first thing that comes up is my dialog here that allows me to manage and customize the import on the fly. Um, this was a huge blessing from PTC that came along somewhere circa um, after Wildfire 5, I believe. I can't remember exactly the time frame, but it's been around for a while now that we have this on-the-fly control for importing objects. Um, you can subsequently also create profiles that are specific to importing a specific type of file and things to that effect that you can utilize during the time of import to help expedite this process. However, there's only a few key settings we got to talk about today. I'll mention them as we go through. So at minimum, um, I'll also, and I'll, excuse me, I will also pause at minimum at those times, and I encourage screenshotting at these places um, once we hit these settings and I set them accordingly and I explain that. Um, I'll tell you, this is a good time for a screenshot, and I would encourage that um, if you want to kind of, you know, follow along in this process in some way. But we're going to hit the details tab here now to start there because this is this is the most important stuff about how you import an object to get things right out of the gate. So when we hit the details tab, or excuse me, we hit the details tab, we land on our import profile control. Now the first thing that we we hit here is our model tab that you see. I can't overstate the significance of what's going on on this tab and this particular setting right here. You'll notice by default, in my case, it's set to external. Um, and I am unchecking use templates. Now, nowadays, you can use your own template, 
um, and set external accuracy. Um, there was a problem with this back in Creo 3-ish or something like that, and I did have to set my, um, my, my check mark for use templates to off for a while because it was giving me the accuracy from the template, not giving me the external accuracy. Um, but it, it's, it's been validated by people I work with that uh, that's no longer the case. I just haven't caught up to, to changing my template standard. However, we must set on an initial import the accuracy to be external. I can't overstate that. Um, what this is going to do is tell PTC to go figure out what the math is on this model because that's, that is what it is. Um, just because we would try and import it to a different standard, that only makes the importing process worse. You're trying to rebuild edge definition between surface patches on the object on the fly to a different mathematical standard than it was in fact created with. That's, that's never going to end well. Um, and it does, in fact, create more import problems than it solves by far. Um, I recognize also that sometimes a client might provide you a model that doesn't even meet their own expected standard of spatial definition for finished product quality or something to that effect. Um, I don't have an answer for that that is that is elegant, other than the context of we need to work with those clients and determine whether the accuracy standard is more important, you know, the quality standard is more important, or the, the, the time and expedition of using the current model is more important. Because the math definition is what it is, and we're about to see that when we import this. Because we're going to use external accuracy, we're going to get the definition from the other model. Now, there's a couple of things we need to do along the way also on our surface and topology tab. Topology primarily, but also our surface tab. I tend to make sure that I'm telling Creo to do absolutely positively nothing when I import the object first time. We need to know how bad is bad. Um, we need to make sure that Creo is not performing repair operations on the initial model during import. Because we could be telling Creo to repair things that are, in fact, not broken. I have amazing stories about the, the pain and misery that folks have created by importing objects and just telling Creo or some other system for that fact just to fix it and heal it because it's assumed that that's a part of importing. I don't buy into that theory. Um, I don't believe it's, it's, it's professional to tell a system to make geometric alterations to the underlying file in a case where we don't know that those changes are in fact justified. So in my initial imports, I strongly recommend turning everything off is essentially the, the best method. So I'm advocating for telling Creo not to fix anything. That's what import data doctor is for. But I need to know the scope of this fix. I need to know if it actually needs fixed. And I might create a thing that needs to be fixed by telling Creo to fix it unnecessarily. So we don't do that. So now we visit the topology tab. And we see here that we have joined surfaces from different layer group shell. And we have joined surface from same layer group shell. And they're both set to no. And we have repair unsatisfied unchecked. And we have closed gaps unchecked. The only thing I'm telling it that it's okay to do is solidify a closed volume. If it finds the model to be closed and valid and we don't have any drama here, I'm fine with solidifying it if Creo sees it as a solidifiable object. I'm not fine with Creo telling it to fix something until I've had my eyeballs on it. So this is the this is the setting range that I advocate for everybody to utilize for importing objects and determining the scope of what you're dealing with and what the math is that you have to work with on that model object. So those are the most important settings on here. Um, there are other settings as well for creating labels on points and how you manage curves and things to that effect. Um, but those settings on the topology tab and the surface tab that I showed, a screenshot now on the topology tab is applicable. Um, these are important settings for the initial import. And a screenshot on the surface tab is now applicable. As again, I mentioned, these are important settings for initial importing. And again, 
Um, remember, and I'll visit the page for a screenshot one more time here, uh, the external accuracy, the need for that cannot be overstated. And that resides on our model tab if somebody wishes to take a screenshot there. So those three pages of settings, very significant. Um, in my professional opinion, it's the only way to get started and get started on the right foot. So now that we've hopefully given everybody a chance to do some quick screenshotting, um, we're going to go ahead and say OK, and we're going to finish importing this object by saying OK in the Import New Model dialog. So now we've got our, our, our model object up on the screen. And I'm going to go ahead and put it in a no-hit mode so we can see the depth of our problems. Um, I'm utilizing something I remain very fond of, um, which is a very old-school color scheme in all things PPC. Um, this was a very old wildfire-ish time frame color scheme that I'm still very fond of as it relates to dealing with imported objects because the purple over yellow contrast provides for an excellent, um, an excellent profound view of where you might have problems on the model. Um, however, in, in more modern color schemes, you would see this presented differently. Uh, but the same context applies. Wherever we see yellow on this model right now, we effectively have an import problem where two edges are not welded together in the, in the Creo definition, if you will, in the way that they should be. Um, so we have issues with our model here as we see it now. We're going to go ahead and fix that. However, before we get started, we're going to go spy on the people that gave us the stuff. And we do that by the following process. File, prepare, model properties. Because we have used external accuracy on this, um, we do in fact know by this, by this operation right here, file, prepare, model properties, this is the effective absolute accuracy that I was given for this object. I could want it to be much better than that, but at the end of the day, that is the quality of the math that I was provided. If I subsequently can't meet that quality target for this project with that level of math that you see presented there, somebody is going to remodel this thing in order to hit that quality target. The underlying math that you want for your quality target being better than that doesn't exist here. This is as good as this model is. The other thing to keep in mind is what PTC has done here is set the relative, or excuse me, set the absolute accuracy in this case um, to be equivalent to that model that we imported. That's incredibly important because now when we attempt to repair it, we're going to repair it at the right mathematical definition. If my accuracy is less than, and, and we'll say more coarse and less of less quality than the accuracy I was given, well then I'm doing a poorer job of working and repairing on this model than the definition it was. If I attempt to import this onto a template or a definition having a, a, a more a greater accuracy, meaning a lower number of higher quality. If I attempt to define this onto a template of having higher quality, I'll find myself in a place where the whole model will be potentially worse than what it looks right now after import, and I will also struggle immensely to get import data doctor operations to work because I'm trying to perform an operation at a definition that the underlying math does not support because the underlying math is the number I'm pointing at right now for this model. This is why it's important to start this way before you import objects and attempt to repair them because at the end of the day, repairing them and attempting to repair them to a standard that is, that is of a higher quality than the object was created is definitely an exercise in frustration. Um, I, I, I'm not going to admit that I've never had to do that, but it is, it is incredibly challenging and difficult because you are fighting against the math of the underlying object with the process of repair. So always keep these things in mind that I have shared up to this point as it relates to importing any objects because any import quality and any necessity to use import data doctor can be, you know, can be immensely influenced by these concepts of accuracy and what is the accuracy on the PTC side when we import the object. 
When you import it to a predefined template and you tell it to use internal or automatic accuracy, you're going to end up in a place where you might be fighting against the math you were given. So with that being said, we're going to go start doing some import data doctor stuff on this file and get it back to a place where it's a solid model. But we're going to be doing that to the mathematical standard you see here because we're not going to take an exercise in frustration this afternoon. All right. So that being said, we'll go ahead and close that. Now we access import data doctor by editing the definition of the imported object. After we import something, you get an import feature ID in your tree, and we get to import data doctor by editing the definition of that object. And then we come into the what is the import ribbon, if you will, um, which is the precursor to getting to import data doctor, which we get there by our little hospital button. Um, suitable because of being called import data doctor. So we have our little hospital button here and we're going to fire that off. And now we see the import data doctor ribbon that I subsequently mentioned at the start as we went through the slides and what have you. Okay, so here we are inside of import data doctor and we need to talk about a couple of quick concepts uh, before we dive in and start preparing things. Um, a couple of basic concepts um, now here in inside import data doctor. Um, you don't have the depth of creation here on your create um, tree and menu that you really want. You really just don't have everything on that list you want for, and that's okay because I'm going to show you how to go get it anyway. Um, we're not going to put it on this list. We're just going to go do it in a place that we should be doing it anyway. Um, and you'll see that as part of our concept of repairing this object. Um, that's one of the things to note about the ribbon, and there's a reason for that, and you'll see that as part of this process. Um, so we have that in the context of our ribbon. This is our import data doctor ribbon. It's worth noting that many import data doctor functions, as you will see today, are in fact following the object action workflow, meaning we have to select the object prior to the ribbon highlighting and allowing us the action. This is the same as an extend surface concept in Core Creo. Extend is not enabled on the ribbon until you pick an edge to extend. So there are numerous concepts of workflow inside Import Data Doctor that work the very same way. However, we see right now like the whole ribbon is grayed out and there's just like virtually nothing we can do here. That's because Creo is currently confused and we're being informed that it's confused by our GTS tree over here, okay? This is our GTS tree where my cursor resides right now, over here in this left-hand panel where we're used to seeing the model tree. The GTS tree works kind of like, and I, I, it's difficult for me to use these terms, but they are kind of applicable, so I do, um, assemblies. This is similar to the concept of parts and assemblies inside of the Creo model tree. So what we have right now is a component, which is what we have as we'll loosely define a surface assembly today, okay? And when I open that up, oh gosh, yes, we have a pile of surfaces in our little surface assembly here today. But we also have, as you can see, an independent surface that is not inside the assembly. Now, one of the cool things is when I select on an object inside of the tree, I'll spin the model around and bring it up here so you can kind of see this, you can see that it highlights that surface on the model. So we see the surface on the model that's being highlighted in the tree. Now, what we've got here is essentially a case where it's in fact redundant. We can see that there's kind of two surfaces laying on top of each other. Now, whenever we have a situation where there is more than one object inside of the GTS tree, Creo doesn't know what you want to work on. And that's why the right click menu in the GTS tree has workflows like activate. Because this allows you to activate this assembly and communicate to import data doctor clearly that this is the thing you want to work on. Until you activate this now, your ribbon's not going to light up and you're not going to get your cool repair button and you're not going to be able to do stuff because Creo doesn't know what to work on because there's too many objects with, with separate definition inside of the GTS tree. So 
now that you see that I activated this, my repair button lights up, you know, things can start happening. I'm going to go ahead and deactivate it because that's not really how we want to approach this process. You want to be to a place where you have one component object at the top of your tree, and it includes all of the surfaces that you plan to put into a solid model. So this redundant surface isn't on the menu for us long term. So we're going to go ahead and right click on this guy. We're going to delete it. Now, as soon as we delete it, we see now the system gets it. The same thing of activating happens by default once I've deleted extra stuff and I'm down to one component. I'm now in a space where Creo understands what's going on here and we're ready to go and we can start repairing things. Now, just so it's set, the cool kids don't go hit the repair button now and light this whole model up like you see on my screen. Um, that's not what I would ever encourage anybody to do under any circumstances. Um, you're telling Creo to go do that whole silly thing that we talked about during the initial import process of just go fix the whole model. I don't know if it's broke or not or whatever, but just go fix it. Um, that's not the ideal way to approach these types of problems and solving these issues. And I can assure you, um, under 100% probability, um, the, the model that you're in a hurry for that is really challenging will be the model that does not automatically repair. That's a given. So we don't do this, and I'm going to exit out of that process. We fix what's broke. We don't just attempt to throw the kitchen sink at this model because we can. Now, we take, we're taking a look at it here, and we see we've got a host of issues on the front side of this model here. Um, we've got, you know, things that are all yellow and they're not connected. So we're going to have a little bit of a, a walkthrough about some different repair techniques here in Import Data Doctor now to kind of start zipping up some of this stuff, okay? Now, with that being said, we see we've got an open edge over here on the model where we've got, you know, this yellow edge that I've got highlighted now on your screen. Now, one of the ways we do repairs in Import Data Doctor, the right way to do repairs in Import Data Doctor, is to select adjacent surfaces to the edge that's problematic. So I've now selected both of these surfaces, <coughs> pardon me, adjacent to that edge, and now I'm going to do the repair. The repair is going to be local to those surfaces now. I'm not telling it to go attack the whole model. I'm telling it to fix the thing that I can obviously see as a problem at the end of the day. Now, something to note that's very important. You'll see on your screen how the line that we're trying to repair is green in this preview. That means you're going to get what you want. If that line remains white in this preview, you might as well click the X in the menu, okay, because it's not going to heal. We're going to have to put that on the wireframe to get that to heal, okay? And I'll kind of show that process quickly as well. Now, in this case, we see it's green, so we're going to get a heal on this. We're going to go ahead and click our green check mark, and there we go. And we see it was just that easy to fix just that part of the file, and I didn't have to attack the whole thing. Now, a very important concept in Import Data Doctor is the undo button. Now, notice that I was able to hit the undo button and bring the problem back. We're going to go look at this problem another way to fix it, you know, and things to that effect. However, and we'll talk about putting things on the wireframe. I want to focus on this undo for a second because it's really important. A lot of times people are going to do this repair. We're going to select these two surfaces. We're going to fire off this repair on it. It's still going to be white right there on that line, so it's not going to repair. But somebody clicks the green check mark anyway. That is an enormously bad idea. And if you did that by accident, you want to undo. It's remembered that Creo tried to do that, and it can cause you problems later. Unsuccessful repair attempts should not be kept on the model, okay? I just I don't know how better to explain that, but that is in fact a thing. Unsuccessful repair attempts don't keep them on the model. A successful repair attempt, yes. Unsuccessful, no deal. Okay, so we go ahead and we'll take our repair on this edge now. We've kind of got that zipped up, if you will. Now, other ways to do repairs in Creo are to define gaps and to, you know, a couple of
couple of quick ones are to have gaps. You know, if we can't get something to repair automatically, we can manually define the gap. So I'm going to go ahead and select these two surfaces adjacent to this problem we see here, and I'm going to go ahead and do a repair on that. Now notice, pay close attention to the preview area of my repair problem. It's not green. There will be no joy here. We do not wish to click the green check mark. It seems like nothing happened when we do, but it does cause potential problems downstream, so don't do it. If you're not getting what you want, you have to pay a lot of that. Now, one of the things we can do is define gaps manually and define gaps easily. Um, I use a combination of both in my own personal work, full disclosure. So we can go into gaps and we can say define gaps, and then we can select one of those edges that's a problem, and then you activate the other the other window inside the define gaps dialog box here and then you go pick the other edge and then you say and you make sure that you leave check add to wireframe i don't understand full disclosure why ptc gives us the checkbox i will never understand why we would not repair this and put it on the wireframe i, I full disclosure sean doesn't get that so always make certain that you put it on the wireframe because to me that's the obvious fundamental reason that we're doing this, because you cannot heal a gap that is not on the defined wireframe, okay? So whatever you do, don't uncheck this. And, and again, I can't understand why we can uncheck that box. But we'll go ahead and say, okay. Now we'll notice that when I do my repair, I grab those same two surfaces and I come back for a repair, it's going to put those together. I get a green highlight now. I'll get my joy if I do that. And we see that it zipped that edge, that surface right up, and life is good, and away we go. That's one of the ways we could have attacked this surgically and not thrown this whole kitchen sink thing at the stupid model like we talked about. The other thing, I'm going to go ahead and undo that. The other thing that I want to make sure everybody knows is we can come down here to the fine tool in the bottom of our, in, in down here on our status bar that you've been taught to ignore pretty much, but the status bar does occasionally have some cool stuff in it. Um, this is one of those times we have the fine tool. Um, some people may be familiar with utilizing this in assemblies and other things inside of Core Creo. However, inside of Import Data Doctor, it does the real cool stuff of adding gaps to the list. So we can go find gaps by is less than. And um, when we say is less than, we just choose really large numbers, and then we go find all of the gaps. So we can put an art, you know, a spatially very large number in here, like five, and then go say find now, and find all of the remaining gaps, and then go about healing them and putting them together on the model. However, there can be instances where, as you'll see here, you know, some of these things would not would not collect and heal. I could have selected and collected all those gaps, but it would not have been able to fix the problem in this corner that I'm pointing at right now. The problem is just too grave. I mean, that, there's just too much distance in there. It, it, it can't fix that um, in terms of a gap healing theory. It's just, yes, you can use really big numbers to find all the gaps, but there's still a threshold to what's practical, if I were to say it in a layman's kind of way, if you will. Um, so, you know, selecting all the gaps and saying repair, nope, that's still not utopia. Um, however, we can utilize a host of different things along the way um, to kind of get us to that place. Now, I want to come back to this area we looked at previously and repaired because I want to show another technique on this area. Now, we see in this area that I've got these two edges um, that I repaired, and we can see if I select the edges specifically, it looks like that edge is the one that really has the, the deviation in it. It's, it's got, you know, like that edge is the problem. And, you know, if I could do it, I would just weld it onto the one next to it, right? Well, you can. And that's what this replace functionality is all about up here on your ribbon. Um, you have this replace one-sided edges of the surface theory um, up here on your ribbon. So you can go grab this and you can fire off replace. You pre-select the edge. It's the same deal. So when I click in the background, remember I pre-warned everybody about object action workflows? Welcome to the reason that I did, because this is an object action workflow. You have to select the edge first, and then you can subsequently click replace. Now it wants the edge that you would replace it with. Now I pick the edge next door that I'm fond of, and then I hit my green, or excuse me, then I hit the green check mark. And you see it just swaps over those edges and pulls that surface definition right over there to swap out that edge. 
Um, that's very, very handy stuff. Okay. Um, you know, swapping edges can be equally powerful. Um, when you have a gap situation that maybe it just won't find on its own. Um, historically, in my own personal experience, I've encountered a lot of times where I could swap an edge, but it wouldn't find the gap. Um, it's just a thing. I mean, it's all happening in the background mathematically. So sometimes we have to take a different vector with the math to get where we want to be. So that's why it's important to keep replace in your toolbox as well. Now, down here on the bottom, I reluctantly always show this in my webinars, um, and I preface that by saying reluctantly, because this is like the technique of last resort. Um, I don't really encourage people to do this because of the level at which this technique operates, okay? Um, it's not a utopia thing, and it's not something that should be abused. And it's not something that should be done a lot of, if you will, okay? Um, it's, it's the red button, for lack of a better description, when you're in, a, in an emergency or whatever, if you will. Um, however, we do have an extremely low-level move vertex functionality that allows us to grab a vertex. And you can see, if you're watching here, um, the GoToMeeting doesn't, you know, have a perfect, sim you know, seamless view. But I'll kind of do it really slowly so you can see here. I'm actually clipping that vertex, grabbing it, left hold it, and dragging it down really close to that corner. And then I'm going to let go. And as soon as you do, you can see I kind of drug that vertex over there and snapped it. Um, okay, yeah, that looks good right now. Um, as I back out, you'll see that that doesn't fix this entire edge. You know, that just fixed that corner because there's an underlying problem across that entire edge. You see, and I just drug around physically in 3D space the underlying geometry of the model. I'm not sure we can overstate the significance of that, which is why I, I started this by saying, you know, I'm reserved about showing these things when I do because some techniques are just that powerful that we need to be considerate of their use. And I do consider move vertex to fall into that category at the end of the day. So, but I have shown you the big, you know, the, the nuclear button now, if you will, for how to drag things around on your model. It's worth noting that you can't, you see up here after I've selected that surface that um, the surface is, is, you know, currently, you know, not like showing me that it's in a frozen state. If you have a frozen surface on the object, if you select a surface and it shows you freeze, unfreeze, and that type of theory, um, the surface is currently frozen and you will have to use the unfreeze option up here on it before you can do a move vertex. You can't do a move vertex on a frozen surface, just so it's said. Okay, so that being said, you know, that's the concept of remove vertex. Now, I'm going to go ahead and undo that, that evil thing that we just did where we did our remove, you know, we did our remove vertex. And I'm going to speak to the, the you know, it didn't fix the whole problem. You know, it, it, when I did the move vertex, you know, that edge was still messed up. Well, the edge can be merged, okay? We can essentially merge curves. And if I select that edge using the shift key, in Creo, just like I would do in core parametric to chain an object, if I select across that edge, then I could do a merge curves on that, and then I could merge that into the wireframe, right? Okay, that's one of the ways I could, you know, continue to utilize import data doctor functionality to go fix this stuff. My problem with this is, is we've got problems all the way around the surface at the end of the day, and life is short. Pick a fight with what makes sense. Don't pick a fight in Import Data Doctor with what can be done easily another way. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to fix this whole thing largely all the way around here at the same time by using a piece of functionality that's not in Import Data Doctor. I know this was supposed to all be about Import Data Doctor, and trust me, it'll make sense when we get done, but we're gonna go stop using Import Data Doctor for a second. So in order to fix this deal, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is utilize, I am gonna use Import Data Doctor to get rid of it. So I'm gonna select this surface and, oh, whoops, I didn't wanna measure it. I'm gonna subsequently delete it. So I've just effectively ripped that surface right off the model now and took it away and said, nope, I'm done with you. We're going to go fix this stuff another way. So now that I've done that, I'm going to go ahead and bail out of import data doctor and go back right back out into core Creo. 
Now that I'm in Core Creo, I'm going to go make the surface that I really want. So inside Creo, we're going to go whip up a quick fill surface. Now, I'm not going to explain this in a step-by-step -step process. I'm going to assume on some level that folks are somewhat familiar with making a basic flat fill surface. Um, so in this case, we're going to go whip one of these up real quick um, so that I've got a nice definition to, uh, you know, to patch in on this model. And then we'll see how that concept goes. So here I am inside uh, making out my fill surface, and I'm just going to chain up a bunch of this stuff. And order to uh, kind of make this quick and easy so we'll accept that and then lastly I'll put a line in there across the bottom of my own making because I know that edge on that underlying surface is broken and that's kind of a problem so I'm going to go put my own line in there so I got a weirdness out of the chain here I'm going to have to delete those pieces and then I'm just going to fill it in um, or excuse me I'm going to arc in my apologies I'm going to arc in the, uh, the tangent arc that's subsequently missing from that surface right there. So I've got a nice definition that goes all the way around now. And there I'll kind of stop for a second so you can kind of see on the highlighting um, what we did. You know, we made that surface that lays right on those edges and, you know, covers that whole boundary up. And it's not gapped out. The reason it's not gapped out is because I used the surfaces underneath to make it. So, well, and we do that. But now you see, if anything, you know, on the face of it, I made the model worse, right? You know, I mean, to look at it, you know, everybody's thinking, well, you know, good job, Sean, because, you know, now it's got more yellow problems than what it had to begin with. Bear with me. So what we're going to do now is, <laughs> excuse me, we're going to use a little bit of stuff a lot of people haven't found on their own. So I'm going to pre-select both of these objects in my tree, my fill surface and my import feature. And then I'm going to come over here to the edit group and go find my collapse option. Uh, they always put the coolest stuff on the bottom of these menus. Um, so we're going to go get this collapse option off of the bottom of the edit menu. And you've probably seen it, but unless you were set up like we are right now, where you have an imported feature and uh, some other surface or something, a body, a surface body inside of Creo selected, Collapse won't light up for you. Collapse is also object action workflow at the end of the day. So we're going to go ahead and collapse that stuff. Big fat menu comes up that I always just say okay in. So what happened is, is in your tree now, the surface disappeared, but it's still here on the model. I can still go highlight it. Well, what that did is that collapsed it back into the import feature. So now when we go into import data doctor again, and I'm using the same process to get back in, now you see I've got some interesting stuff here in my, in my GTS tree. I've got a surface. Well, lo and behold, that's the surface that I just created. I've got my component that I was working on before, and I've got a datums group. The reason I've got a datums group is because that surface – was I built a datum on the fly. I used an embedded datum to define the plane for that surface. I built that from both of these two, um, you know, left, right, long opposing edges to define that plane quickly on the fly. So because that plane is a part of that surface definition, it comes in import data doctor too. Um, the cool thing is, is we can just get rid of it because we just really don't need that plane anymore. We just used it to build this surface. So you simply select it in the tree and delete it, and that gets rid of it. Now the cool stuff happens. All I have to do is take this surface up here in my GTS tree and drag and drop it into my component. And this is why we did it this way. And now I have a scenario where it repaired that thing all the way around with the exception, with the ex exception of this edge where we know that surface has that underlying broken edge. Now at this time, I would just attempt to do a repair. I would pre-select and just attempt to do a repair on those surfaces. And you see here, nope, they, they don't fly. It's not going to repair that up. If I click the green check mark, it's still not repairing that. So we need to do an undo on that. Okay, so we did our undo. One of the things you can do is build services inside of Import Data Doctor. You do have some limited functionality. So we'll go through that process. Now, I'm going to go ahead and select that surface. We're going to go ahead and delete it. I'm going to go ahead and light up my boundary blend on my import data doctor menu, and I'm going to go ahead and simply put a boundary blend in here. I'm going to select those two edges, and then we're going to make the other edges the second direction curves. Okay, so I grab all those. 
I bring those in there, that makes another surface in my GTS tree. After I complete the boundary blend, it's at the top of my GTS tree. I can simply continue to drag things into my component then. I created that surface, I dragged it into the component, it automatically tries to heal it up and, and you know, weld it into the total component. So we've got one more thing to do here. We've got a missing surface right here in this area. And I can do the same type of boundary bound solution on it because the surface is bloody missing. There's nothing to fix here because we just didn't get the surface on the import. Um, I can't repair something that doesn't exist, obviously. So I'm going to go ahead and select those edges and go through the typical boundary blend creation process here. And we're going to grab that boundary blend and fill it in there. And we're going to go ahead and say OK. It does the same thing again. The newly created boundary blend is dropped at the top of my GTS tree, ready and available for me to just drag right into the component underneath of it. And as soon as you do that, you'll notice that now I've got a nice, complete purple model. So this is ready for solidification. And on our way out to solidify this model before we move into question and answer mode today, I want to show one more key part of Import Data Doctor that not everybody stumbles on. Um, geometry checks is different inside of Import Data Doctor. You have, when you fire off the geometry checks um, setting from the far left hand, you know, ribbon menu here, you can go to the Edit tab, and inside of Import Data Doctor, you have specific IDD settings for this. Now, I like showing everybody this because sometimes you're going to have, you know, short one sided edges and small loops and these things. And it can just be so mathematically infinitesimally small that it's non-visual. You can't see it in regardless of your screen color, you know, contrast, that there's a problem in some terribly small area of the model. You can, in fact, set these settings to detect and find that stuff. And then when you run the geometry check functionality on your import feature, um, you'll get feedback that says, hey, you've got these problems. I'm going to go ahead and undo that surface I just created and rerun the geometry check. And now you see I've got a whole bunch of gaps and you can pick on these things and it will take you right to that area of the model where it sees that problem. And now, of course, you see I have a bunch of gaps not added to the wireframe. Well, it's not, it's not valuable to add these gaps to the wireframe because um, they don't have an adjacent surface that we would be potentially welding them to in the current condition. So keep this in mind. This can be in, in infinitely valuable to you to find incredibly small issues on the import model that you're trying, you know, Creo's saying, hey, I will not solidify this, but you're looking at it in this context and saying, I can't see the problem anymore. The IDD check setting formula and your ability to manipulate it will take you to the place of getting to figure out why it's not solidifying your model. Now, you'll notice today that I didn't really have any drama with the concept of, you know, repairs on this model. Everything pretty much went the way I was speaking it was going to go. There's a reason for that, and it's because we took the time to make sure that we repaired this on the same mathematical standard it was built on because that's the math we were given. And like I said, the two things to remember, um, friends don't send friends I just files. And just because you want different math doesn't mean that's what this model is. The model is that point oh six 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 whatever and change, 837, whatever it was, accuracy value that we imported it to. You know, making sure I'm going to exit out of import data doctor now and we'll see that I can solidify this model. I will set the quilt down here in my selection filter, and I grab the model and I say solidify, and now I have my white outline in Creo indicating that I have in fact solidified this model. But I did everything to the standard that the model mathematically existed at as it was provided to me. Um, that's what this math is. That may not meet the quality standard for this work, this project, this job, this vendor, this thing, but that's what this math is. And at the end of the day, we repaired it to that math standard, and now we have a solid model. I'm not saying that's good enough, but I am saying if I go start making that number notably lower right now, I'm likely to start spending an enormous amount of time inside of Import Data Doctor 
to try and weld that together because the math that was there isn't likely to support the standard of edge definition at the new accuracy that I would be setting it to. So keep that in mind. Those are those are important concepts as it relates to importing objects. Um, one of the things I want to quickly mention and show, <coughs> pardon me, um, before we break off the Q&A, is there is a document about all this stuff out there. I'm pulling it up now. Bear with me. Um, you know, let me see if I can get it in a good view here. Yes, there we go. Um, getting started with Creo Parametric Import Data Doctor 1.0. This is the document I wanted to go find on the PTC website to share the link to everybody with. Um, this is the, it's 111 pages, but it will tell you, in my professional opinion, just about everything you need to know about Import Data Doctor. It does not speak to the accuracy concepts that I mentioned, but it does speak to the repair workflow and techniques. Um, if you follow up to me with an email, I'll figure out a way to get you this document or I'll figure out where the heck it is at PTC so I can directly link you out to it. Um, I, like I said, I wanted to make that part of the webinar today. I went looking for it this morning. They changed the website every week, it seems like. I couldn't find it. So my apologies. I do have the document, so it, I can share it to you. You'll just have to follow up to me with email or something like that, and you know I'll give you this document. Um, there's a lot more in it than what we covered today, um, clearly at 111 pages, but I tried to make sure to hit the important stuff that I use as bread and butter technique for me to get models into Creo and get to work as opposed to get to repairs. Um, because we can clearly get into infinite loops of repairs if we're not careful about how we do accuracy and grabbing the whole model and clicking repair every time and, you know, things like that. That's just never advisable. Okay. So with that being said, I'm almost out of time here, but um, I will stay late um, if there are continue to be questions and things to that effect. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart, obviously. So if, if folks are hanging around and still ask, asking questions after 1130 or excuse me, 1230 here, I'll still be, I'll still be punching out answers to everybody. Um, I'm going to open up now to take questions. Again, use the go to meeting uh, question, you know, punch a question functionality to me. And uh, when we do that, I will go ahead and, um, you know, speak to those questions to the entire group so the entire group can benefit from them. Um, so now it's we're going into a, to a question and answer mode. And again, I, I tremendously appreciate everybody's time. And um, I will be working to knock down some questions as they come up. OK, um, one of the questions I do have uh, pending already is, um, is import data doctor included with the standard Creo license or is it? Um, or is it an additional module that uh, must be purchased? Um, no, this is included stuff. Um, that's one. It's one of the most priceless things, in my opinion. I mean, they sell programs for like tens of thousands of dollars called CAD Fix and stuff like that. And um, I, I can do things in Creo Import Data Doctor, and I can get a solid model when CAD Fix chokes on it. Um, I've done it repeatedly in my own professional history. So um, it's one of the things I'm just, I'm, I'm definitely a fan. PTC includes this for everybody. It's core functionality. Every license of Creo drives this thing. It includes it. Um, it's, you don't pay any more for it. It's just, and it's, it's in my professional opinion, the, the best data entry, or excuse me, the best data exchange tool set on the market at any price period um regardless of of what it is um so yes that stuff comes right out of the gate everybody's got access to uh to the concept of import data doctor stuff um without issue as far as that deal goes um does the solidify um feature have any advantage over import as a solid very good question um what i did here is i solidified this on the way, you know, or excuse me, after I got out of import data doctor. Um, one of the things to note, I'm going to delete the solidify off my model tree here, and we're going to jump back into just the import data doctor pre ribbon. Um, you can import as a surface or you can import as a solid. My understanding now is the biggest, the biggest implication here is how it's handled with the whole import notification thing that has been added in the more recent versions of Creo. Full disclosure, Sean's always had a policy of solidifying a model in the tree that I had to repair to remind myself I did that. 
Um, for no other reason than that, it's always been my own personal workflow that if I import it and I don't get a salad out of the box and I had to touch it, I usually solidify that in the tree to tell myself I did that. But that's just a Sean thing. There, there isn't arguably necessarily justification for that in, in a meaningful, it matters to Creo one way or another sense. You still have a solid model either way. If I click this button and I exit now, I get my solid model just like I did if I would solidify it. Um, it I, I think it's more personal preference than it is anything else at the end of the day. However, it can have implications with import notifications. If you have import as a solid set, you will be notified by potentially import notification nagging um, down here like the regeneration manager thing to tell you that you failed that import process uh, because it's attempting to solidify instead of just taking the import as is. So that is potentially the only implication I'm aware of about the distinction between import as solid, as I showed at the latter workflow, and import then solidify as what I did as part of the demonstration. Um, so that's, you know, it hopefully speaks to those two questions that have kind of came in already. Um, yes, absolutely. Those are, you know, the thoughts I can share as it relates to that. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and while we're taking questions and people might be typing them, I'm going to put my contact information stuff um, from in our sales team's information, company information. Uh, please visit our YouTube channel. Um, a, a version of this webinar I did in 2017, I think, is, is up there on the YouTube channel, as well as other engineers like myself um, that have done the same webinar. And, oh, my gosh, there's just a million webinars up there now. Um, so there's just about a webinar for about anything you want to know about Creo these days. So you can go get some, you know, diversity of, of thought related to this topic as well, um, just from our YouTube channel at Boundary, because as I mentioned, other engineers other than myself have also provided their take on the theory of importing and things to that effect. So I definitely encourage you guys to hit the webinar channel and things to that effect. Um, my email and our sales team contact information and our website, uh, uh, you know, link, if you will, are all the information that are up on the screen right now. Um, and again, you know, I'm going to keep the, I'll keep this open here for another 10 minutes minutes or so um, it, it, to, to take a chance on, you know, folks might, you know, still be stabbing in questions in some way and taking the time to type them, of course. Um, so we'll keep this open for a while. Um, if we don't have any more questions come in, maybe in the next 10 minutes, um, then I'll close everything down. Um, I'm going to go ahead and be quiet in the interest of waiting for those questions to come in um, and keep this contact information and stuff up. Um, I just do want everybody to know that I'm here. Uh, punch your question out to me so I can get right after that. And I'll obviously bring Creo back to the screen instead of my contact information if we need to show something to speak to the question. And again, we'll keep that going for about another 10 minutes or so here, and um, then we'll wrap everything up. Um, in advance of that, I do encourage everybody to, uh, to take a screen screenshot of this thing. If you've got any interest in that PDF document, um, you've got question follow-ups, um, you want to talk to myself or our team about anything, uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out to, to us. This is what we do. Um, so by all means, you know, get a screenshot of this contact information and if you think a follow-up has value for you and uh, we'll see to you that that follow-up happens. And I can't stress enough um, my thankfulness for everybody's time today. You know, it takes time out of your day um, to go ahead and spend time with us to, you know, participate in one of these webinars. So we greatly appreciate the time that everybody takes to do that. And uh, we hope that the upshot of that is that we shared real valuable information with you today and that our follow-ups would you know, subsequently meet expectations if you so choose to do that. But um, we encourage you to do it again. Um, I can't thank you enough for your time and your participation in this webinar. And with that, I'm just going to kind of be quiet and uh, speak to any questions that come in in the next 10 minutes or so. And uh, then, like I said, right around, uh, you know, what will be on my computer clock, as you can see on your screen, um, what will be on my computer clock right around 20 till. Um, if I'm not in the middle of answering questions and stuff, um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up then. So again, many thanks for your participation today, folks, and uh, good luck with your import data doctor adventures.
Okay, we've got a very good question came in. All right, so using the native accuracy, and I'm going to assume that the questioner means that the, the native model accuracy, what we found when we imported it. And how would I integrate that into a die, be that progressive die, mold die, whatever the case may be, um, with a different absolute accuracy? Very good question. Always comes up in these webinars under this circumstance. You have effectively a couple of choices here. Um, if we're talking about a progressive die, let's say, for instance, and this is a, a, you know, a non-part contact component or something to that effect, if you're not going to be doing assembly operations on it, and I'm going to jump in here real quick and uh, make a new assembly so I can kind of show you what I'm talking about here. So uh, let me make a quick assembly. So if you were not doing these component operations, oh, let me just pull this down again. Component operations here on the menu. Um, if we're just talking about uh, something that is not using, uh, let's say, the Creo, you know, TDO environment or tool design option, okay? If we're not talking about a tool design option environment, and I'll speak to that in a second. Um, if we're not talking about a tool design operator, tool design environment, you're likely to be doing these component operations between objects, whether we're talking about a mold, a prog die, whatever kind of die it is today, you know, uh, you know, aluminum, you know, you know, die cast, whatever. If I don't have to cut or do these component operations with the model that we are talking about that has this different accuracy than all of my other standard company parts that I'm creating, then I don't have a problem here. Creo doesn't care what the individualized accuracy of an object is until you try and do something with it against another object. That's when things get kind of unfortunate because if I have to do a component operation between this, we'll say, you know, the imported part and something that pre-exists in my assembly at a different accuracy, this is the bad news of what I've been mentioning in this webinar. You don't get back math you never had. You have effectively two choices. Somebody's going to remodel that object, equivalent spatial definition, inside of Creo at the accuracy standard your die set needs and expects in order for that object to live there and be cuttable, mergeable, manageable, in a TDO or assembly component operation sense, or you're going to change that project's accuracy to what we'll just loosely call the lowest common denominator. But in this case, it's not really the lowest. It's the highest common denominator. You're going to make the project accuracy the imported part so that you can do those functional workflows between objects whether that's a component cutout or that's TDO-based volume operations and things to that effect inside of TDO. This is the un unfortunate reality where clients provide one level of math and that level of math is not in accordance with said client's expectation. There is no easy answer for that. There just never will be. Um, the math that exists on the model exists on the model I can't make it a different math than it, than it was provided unless somebody remodels it to that standard. So the unfortunate reality is you either reduce, you know, the accuracy of the entire project to match that imported file, which is the preferred technique, because if that's the quality of the file that was provided to you and it's a client-based operation, um, that, that's, you're basing it literally on their expectations at that point. Um, or somebody's going to remodel that thing to, to meet the standard of the other part accuracies because the problem is going to be you're going to have that object inside of another object assembly and you're going to want to do TDO functions on that or you're going to want to do component operations and those things require matched accuracy. So all the objects have to have the same accuracy for that workflow to be supported. So it is what it is. At that point, you're going to have to figure out the accuracy to one side or the other of it, unfortunately. But that is that is the reality as it speaks to when I integrate native accuracy or integrated imported accuracy into my assembly, um, there can be real problems there in a case where we're talking about client deliverables and their expectations aren't in accordance with the model that they provided. Um, 
it, but just because you set the accuracy, just so it's set, if I go in and I manage to, you know, let's say my accuracy is a tenth English, and um, this model that came from my client is two thousandths accuracy English equivalent, um, you know, so it's 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 beyond ten to one. Um, at that point. I, you know, the, the quality of the client's expectation is everything. They, their model may not, in fact, get them to their own quality expectation. Um, just because I set my accuracy inside of Creo and I import it and I get it all sealed up, that model is still fundamentally 2000s English accuracy. Just because you imported it doesn't mean it got rebuilt geometrically to some new elegant standard that was a part of the underlying template that was being used. So it, it does not work that way. Um, you may import a valid model at a higher accuracy. I'm not, I'm not questioning that that's possible. It happens all the time. But what we would really want to be occurring there is not what is occurring there um, at the end of the day. You're just getting a valid solid, and you do get it at that accuracy inside of Creo, but that doesn't make its underlying math any better than that number I showed you that we can go see by the importing process. So hopefully, good news, bad news, or otherwise, that speaks to the totality of you know what we have to deal with when we have a model and it's not like you know one of these things is not like the other type stuff and we've got to deal with that concept of of making that thing like the other um, those are just the ways that it can be handled so hopefully like i said good news bad news hopefully that gives you some depth in the context of speaking to you know how that gets handled when we do in fact have a mismatch uh, condition like that. So uh, with that being said, you know, um, we'll go a couple more minutes here, I guess. Um, I ran a little long on, you know, answering that question. Um, so I would hope maybe if there's any more questions coming in that we're typing them up soon here now. Um, so by all means, you know, hit me with those questions if they come in. I really appreciate the opportunity to answer and speak to these questions. Um, if you, you know, take the time to ask them, obviously. So yeah, we'll go a couple more few minutes here. And um, if we, we don't get any more questions, then we'll wrap this thing up. Okay, uh, last call for questions and screenshots here. Um, absent a question coming in in the next little bit here, a couple seconds or whatever, um, while we're wrapping up, I'm going to go ahead and close up our meeting today. And again, um, I, I extend my, my, my gratitude for everybody's time and participation and uh, the follow-up questions that were provided. Um, I'm always thankful for the chance to speak to that and get an opportunity to talk about importing data inside of Creo. So without a doubt, again, thank you for your participation. Um, again. If it's of value to you, take a screenshot, grab our contact information, and um, follow up information there. Again, I encourage you, this video will likely be uploaded to our uh, uh, Boundary Systems YouTube channel. Um, there's a previous version, as I mentioned, from 2017 up there now, as well as 
the same topic covered by other engineers. So there's a great diversity of knowledge, opinion, and information related to importing data um, available at our YouTube channel. And I strongly encourage everybody to, to get a chance to grab that and follow up with it. Um, and with that, um, I haven't caught any more questions coming in. So I will say my final thank you. Um, and again, um, for your participation and the chance to present Import Data Doctor to you folks today. So thank you and I wish everybody a great day.